So welcome to the case for fiber-rich farm policy, a panel discussion among many experts drawn from across the supply chain and policy arena around the need for increasing investment into fiber-rich farm foods and policy to support that future. I'm joined today by an excellent lineup of panelists who are able to speak expertly across many of the issues that are, we're confronting today. We'll have remarks from each of our panelists, uh, directed remarks at the beginning, and I'll go ahead and walk us through them. And then at the end, I'm excited to be able to engage in both directed conversation among the panelists, as well as utilizing the questions that have been submitted online. So please do submit those. Our lineup today involves Dr. Will Bolshevitz, who is a gastroenterologist um, and is the author of the book, Fiber Fueled. Uh, Tracy McWhorter, who is the founder and CEO of 10 Million Black Vegan Women and an adjunct professor at the University of District Columbia Center for Nutrition, Diet and Health, and the author of two books. Miyoko Shinner, who is the founder and CEO of Miyoko's Creamery. Miyoko's award-winning plant-based cheeses and butters are found in thousands of stores across the US like Costco and Safeway. Also, Paul, who is a fifth-generation Wisconsin dairy farmer, who is slowly transitioning his farm to hazelnut production. Also, Laura Reese, who is our gracious host today from the Agriculture Fairness Alliance and is the organizer of this excellent webinar. However, first, I'm going to hand it to our opening remarks to Christy Anderson, who is the Senior Government Relations Advisor at the American Heart Association. Christy, take it away. Great. Thank you, Addison, and hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Um, as Addison mentioned, we've got an esteemed panel that will make the case for prioritizing fiber-rich foods in farm policy. Um, as Addison said, I'm Christy Anderson. I'm our Senior Government Relations Advisor at the American Heart Association and manage our federal advocacy work for nutrition policy. So first, why focus on fiber-rich foods? While it is important to eat a variety of foods and think about diet quality beyond just fiber rich, fiber rich foods are a great source of providing nutrients we need, such as the suite of B vitamins, iron, magnesium, and selenium. Fiber rich foods are also found in foods more Americans need in their diets, such as fruits, vegetables, and whole grains, and tend to be lower in things we need to eat less of, such as saturated fats, added sugars, and sodium. Dietary fiber has been shown to help improve cholesterol, which in turn lowers the risk of heart disease, our nation's number one killer and costliest preventable chronic disease, stroke, obesity, and type two diabetes. And, you know, with New Year's coming up can also help with weight loss. However, our food system is contributing to a chronic disease crisis and a, a crisis in which proper nutrition and diet quality play a large role in mitigating and preventing these diseases. Now, in the materials you received, uh, one of the materials is a GAO report. So if you haven't read it, I would encourage you to read that recently released report, which analyzes the nutrition-related chronic disease crisis and the federal government's response. Um, if you all have like eight hours, we could go through the report, but that's not why we're here today. We're here to hear, hear from this panel of esteemed, esteemed experts. Say that fast three times. Uh, one big takeaway from the report is that government spending, including Medicare and Medicaid, to treat cardiovascular disease, cancer, and diabetes accounts for 54% of the $383.6 billion in healthcare costs to treat these specific conditions. But beyond just federal government spending, when looking at the aggregate of all levels of government costs and private sector costs, Cardiovascular disease alone costs this country $363.4 billion annually in both direct, i.e. medical, and indirect, i.e. lost productivity costs. So when talking about nutrition policy, I sometimes get the pushback that diet is an individual choice. And yes, the foods we eat should be an individual choice, but for too many, the choice to eat a healthy diet and fiber-rich foods isn't even an option. If the chronic disease crisis and the COVID pandemic has taught us anything, it is that we need to be bold in changing food and nutrition policy to support healthy eating with a particular focus on under-resourced communities and BIPOC communities. And we really have a unique opportunity in this upcoming farm bill to make these changes needed to our food system to ensure equitable access to healthy foods. I mean, not just food security, but nutrition security as well. Or as I like to say, not calories for the sake of calories, 
but nutritious calories that are going to help people thrive. While most people think Title IV, the nutrition title in the Farm Bill is a place to address diet quality, and it is to an extent, policy changes need to extend beyond the nutrition title. If everyone in this country overnight suddenly adopted and had the means to access a diet aligned with the dietary guidelines for Americans, there would not be enough fiber-rich foods, such as fruits, vegetables, and whole, green, whole grains. To better support Title IV programs and other nutrition programs beyond the Farm Bill and healthy eating broadly, we need to update and modernize the other Farm Bill titles and policies within to address production of healthy foods with a focus on these fiber-rich foods. And now I will turn it over to Dr. Will Bolshewitz, who will talk about what happens when people don't eat enough dietary fiber. Thank you, Christy. Hello, everyone. It's an honor to speak to you today about the role of dietary fiber in human health. I am Dr. Will Bolsowitz, and I'm a practicing gastroenterologist in Charleston, South Carolina. And I'm also the New York Times bestselling author of a book called Fiber Fueled. You've just heard about the cost of heart disease, cancer, stroke, and diabetes in dollars and cents. But let's not lose sight of the fact that every single dollar is a real human being whose life has been upended by a preventable disease. My message to you today is that we could reduce the burden of these diseases if we simply shift our diet to include more fiber. And in the next few minutes, I'm gonna show you how. But first, let's start with the basics. What is dietary fiber? It is a complex polysaccharide, a carbohydrate that naturally exists in plants and mushrooms. All plants and mushrooms contain dietary fiber. You will only find dietary fiber in plants and mushrooms. They have a monopoly on this nutrient. And an important point, variety is very important. The fiber in a black bean is not the same as the fiber in an apple. I'm gonna come back to this point again in a moment. Perhaps you've heard the old story about dietary fiber that it simply sweeps its way through the intestines unchanged and then comes out the other end. This view is old, it's outdated, and we have new laboratory techniques in emerging science that are showing us a different view of fiber. It's revamped, it's exciting, and dare I say it, it's sexy. Fiber is fuel for our gut microbes. It breeds life into our gut microbiome. You see, living inside of us are 38 trillion invisible microorganisms. This is our gut microbiome. And they actually outnumber our human cells. Believe it or not, you are less than 50% human. They play a role in our digestion. They have literally 60,000 unique digestive enzymes they use to unpack our food, including our dietary fiber. They also play a role in our immune system metabolism, hormones, mood, brain health, even the expression of our genetic code. They are powerful. And when they are out of balance, which we call dysbiosis, they've been associated with Western diseases like coronary artery disease, colorectal cancer, breast cancer, diabetes. But when they're in balance, they help to protect us from these diseases. Let's follow the path of fiber. When we consume plants and mushrooms, dietary fiber escapes digestion in the stomach and the small intestine, and it arrives intact into the colon, the large intestine. There, our microbial friends get to feast. This is their preferred food, fiber. And once again, variety is important. Different plants are the food for different microbes. The microbes use their digestive enzymes to process and unpack the fiber. And in doing that, they actually transform it into the most healing most anti-inflammatory molecule that I've ever come across, short-chain fatty acids. If you have not heard of short-chain fatty acids, it's time for me to bring you up to date because this is one of the most exciting things happening in science right now. Mechanistic research shows us that short-chain fatty acids reverse dysbiosis, restore the gut microbiome to health and balance. Cancer cells are shriveling in their boots when they come across short-chain fatty acids because they alter gene expression in cancer cells stop them from multiplying, and program cancer cells to be destroyed. Short-chain fatty acids alter our metabolism. They affect energy balance, satiety after meals, fat metabolism, insulin sensitivity, and blood lipids. You don't need to memorize these things. Basically, I'm just telling you a simple thing that short-chain fatty acids can improve obesity, cardiovascular disease, and diabetes. And there's so much more that I would love to celebrate about short-chain fatty acids, but this is a short talk, so I'm gonna move on and just say that these are the mechanism behind the healing power that you find in dietary fiber. But here's the question, does it translate? Do people have less disease? Are lives being saved by dietary fiber? Let's find out. 
the highest quality research that exists are called meta-analyses. Meta-analyses are where we aggregate data from large-scale human studies, and we bring them together into one super study. So today I'm going to share with you a meta-analysis, the largest study to date of dietary fiber in human health, conducted by Dr. Andrew Reynolds, which was published in The Lancet in February of 2019. They included 185 prospective studies, 135 million person years of data, and 58 clinical trials. So after pulling together this ridiculous amount of data, here's what they found. When people consume more dietary fiber, they lose weight, lower their blood pressure, and lower their cholesterol. These are all risk factors for heart disease. They're less likely to have a heart attack. They're less likely to die from heart disease, our number one killer. They're less likely to be diagnosed with colorectal, breast, or esophageal cancer. They're less likely to die from cancer, our number two killer. They're less likely to have a stroke, our number five killer, or to be diagnosed with diabetes, our number seven killer. And no surprise, those who consume more dietary fiber, they live longer. This is just one study. There are thousands more to support the health benefits of a fiber-enriched diet. We could look at dietary fiber and chronic kidney disease, Alzheimer's, even COVID-19. These are three of our most deadly diseases right now. Guess what? Dietary fiber appears to be beneficial in each of these cases. So my talk has been all, all rainbows and butterflies so far. Uh, dietary fiber is wonderful. It can massively help human populations if consumed in adequate amounts. But there's a problem. People are not consuming anywhere close to the recommended amount of dietary fiber. The US, the US Institute of Medicine recommends that men consume 38 grams of fiber per day and women 25 grams of fiber per day. According to our most recent data, the average US man is consuming 18. The average US woman, 15. And in communities with less food accessibility, even uh, especially black communities, people are eating even less fiber than the wider population. Some estimates put it at 20% less, which is very disconcerting. This is not half of an optimal dose of fiber. This is half of the minimum dose of fiber. 95% of Americans are deficient in fiber intake. And if you review the newly released 2020 dietary guidelines, you will quickly see why. 80% don't meet the fruit recommendations, 90% don't meet the vegetable recommendations, and 98% don't meet the whole grain recommendations. Those are the fiber-containing foods. And so here we are. Last year, 690,000 deaths from heart disease, 598,000 deaths from cancer, 159,000 deaths from stroke, 101,000 deaths from diabetes, not to mention the 530,000 deaths from COVID-19, Alzheimer's, and chronic kidney disease. These are sobering numbers, but they can be empowering if you consider the opportunity that exists. If we could just get more fiber into Americans' tummies, passing through to the gut microbes so that they can be turned into short chain fatty acids. Benjamin Franklin once said, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. An ounce is 28 grams. If everyone in America added 28 grams of fiber to their diet, we would do a heck of a lot more than a pound of cure. Thank you. Dr. Bolfichowicz, thank you very much for those enlightening numbers and those, that excellent uh, remarks. Um, next, we're going to turn now to Tracy McWhirter for her remarks. Hello, my name is Tracy McWhirter. I work as a public health nutritionist, helping people eat more fiber-rich plant-based foods for better health. I've been doing this work for more than 30 years. From the beginning, African-American foodways had their historical roots in the fiber-rich diets of our African ancestors. And this fiber-rich culinary heritage survived 400 years of our sojourn here in the United States, through enslavement, Jim Crow, the Great Migration, and the civil rights and Black liberation movements. Through the dietary upheavals of these past four centuries, African Americans have maintained an affinity for growing, purchasing, and eating fiber-rich foods. In fact, Chin Ju, the author of Supersizing Urban America, said in a, two, in a 2017 Pacific Standard interview, that 1965 dietary surveys show that before the proliferation of fast food franchises in the 1970s, African Americans in cities were twice as likely to meet the dietary recommendations for fruits, vegetables, and fiber than the overall US population. However, that began to systematically change in the 1970s. 
in the Pulitzer Prize winning book Franchise, The Golden Arches in Black America by Marcia Chaitlin and in Jews Supersizing Urban America, both authors talk about fast food restaurants targeting African-American neighborhoods with the help of federal subsidies following the rebellions after the assassination of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. in 1968. Indeed, African-American neighborhoods in major cities went from having no fast food chains to being proliferated by them. With the help of federal subsidies, fast food companies targeted African-American communities with cheap, low fiber, low nutrition, high calorie food and relentless advertising. As a result of this systematic targeting, African-Americans went from being the highest consumers of fiber-rich food to being the lowest consumers by 1996. And that targeting continues today, along with systemic decreased access to healthy foods. One of the results has been higher rates of chronic diseases, disability, and premature death. And yet, next to this wide ocean of, syst of systematic targeting, there has continued to be a mighty river of African-Americans leading the way to growing and providing fiber-rich foods in their communities across the country. Indeed, these centuries-long, ever-evolving local food movements are the blueprint. We need to follow their lead and help empower their innovation to expand nutrition equity and better health in Black communities throughout the country. Specifically, the Office of Urban Agriculture and Innovative Production has the potential to directly improve food resiliency and public health by helping local communities exponentially increase their capacity to implement sustainable and restorative farming practices in today's crucial and uncertain times. In this way, the USDA can help prioritize naturally fiber-rich foods and help make fiber-rich foods available to everyone, especially African-American communities. Thank you. Thank you, Tracy. Um, I'm Miyoko. I'm Miyoko Schinner of Miyoko's Creamery, a leading brand in the rapidly growing plant-based sector. At Miyoko's, we make butter and cheese from milk made from plants such as nuts, seeds, and oats. Today, we see a rapidly growing shift among consumers towards plant-based products for reasons of health and environment. As an example of this is that plant-based milks now have about 15% market share in the fluid milk category. And this tide is rising quickly for plant-based burgers, butter and cheese as well, all categories that have been growing at between 20 and 50% annually. As this trend increases, what does it mean for farmers who have been feeding America? How can we help bring traditional farming operations, including dairy, into this burgeoning new fiber-rich economy and not leave them behind? Luckily, there are many opportunities. Crops such as oats and peas, fiber-rich, are facing a huge shortage as the demand for these plant proteins grow. The demand for peas is expected to quadruple by 2025, and plant-based companies are scrambling to secure supply chain. In addition, many of these crops are imported from Canada and other countries instead of being cultivated here in the United States. Many plant-based food producers, including us, import raw materials from as far away as Vietnam and China because we can't find ample sources here in the United States. There is far more demand by plant-based companies for fiber-rich crops than supply. At Miyoko's, as one solution to this problem, we have initiated a farm transition program that will help a dairy farmer convert to growing key crops that will become part of not only our supply chain, but our innovation platform, where we're discovering new ways to make plant proteins every single day. We, along with several nonprofits, have launched programs to help farmers producing more conventional protein sources convert their operations to producing mushrooms, grains, legumes, tree nuts, seeds, all protein and fiber rich foods that can easily be turned into innovative and sustainable plant-based foods for the future. But we can't do it alone. While my company is providing the financial support and other resources to the farmer, we'll need a lot more help to support farmers who wanna make that transition. We all read too many stories of bankruptcies and suicides by farmers. Let's help them stay on the land that they love and let's help them be successful by rethinking food production and growing fiber rich foods. And let's create a government program that provides them 
with the resources to become successful partners in this new paradigm for a sustainable future of food. Let's liberate the American farmer and let's take back power and let them take power back into their own hands. Thank you. Excellent, thank you, Miyoko. And now turning to Paul. Paul. Hello, it's a shame you can't see my face right now. I'm a fifth generation dairy farmer from Western Wisconsin. My wife and I are in the process of taking over the family farm, which consists of 200 cows and about a thousand acres. However, due to the continuing consolidation of the dairy industry and its movement away from the traditional family farm, we don't plan on the next generation milking cows. Up until five years ago, the plan was to buy and expand the herd of cows. As we were putting numbers together, it became very clear that money was going to be tight. We weren't comfortable with a business plan that relied on funding from government programs to stay afloat. About the same time, I was looking into perennial crops. I wanted to know if it was possible to grow some sort of nut crop at a commercial level, cold hardy enough to survive the Wisconsin winter. It took some time, but I came across information on hazelnuts and the emerging group of people trying to grow them and establish a hazelnut industry in the Midwest. Our farm is in a driftless region. We live in the part of Wisconsin that didn't get run over by a glacier. We farm deep valleys and steep hills. Growing just corn and soybeans is not a realistic option. We currently strip crop with alfalfa hay to avoid erosion and nutrient runoff. Inserting strips of hazelnuts would be a great way to replace the unneeded dairy use hay and continue to farm our hills. My wife and I want to continue to raise our family on the farm. We understand that we're just stepping stones for our kids and the next generation. We want our kids to have a chance to pursue agriculture and take over this land someday. We don't want them to be forced into something they'll have to work their tails off to keep afloat or have to rely on government funding to survive. With the current dairy industry and climate change issues, our size of dairy farm is not a long-term option. I am very grateful for what businesses like Miyoko's Creamery are doing. A common sight driving through the rural Midwest are well-kempt farmhouses surrounded by an arrangement of dilapidated farm buildings. Communities that once held a dozen or more farmstead families now may have one or two. Fertile land that held so much pride and promise has been overrun by development and, taking out, and taken out of production forever. There are a number of farmers like me who can see what's coming, whether it be climate or economic factors, to keep small or smaller farms in business is going to require specific actions. We can't all keep doing what we are doing. My uncle mentioned suicide. Dairy farming is mentally tough. Far too often you find, about, you find out about a farmer who ran himself into the ground mentally, physically, or financially. It is a very real and common problem. Transitioning a farm is a long-term process. Education and grower outreach will be important. This multi-generational journey will continue. My four children live in a house partially built by their great, great, great grandfather. What we have is special and important and worth fighting for. There will be ups and downs and plenty of new challenges on the way, but I think we are on the right path. I appreciate these opportunities with AFA and with Myoko's Creamery. Thank you. Thank you, Paul, for those important words. Now we'll turn to Laura. To be, who's going to bring us back and talk about how we can prioritize fiber rich foods. Hi, I'm Laura Reese, uh, Executive Director of Agriculture Fairness Alliance. Thank you everyone on the panel for preparing remarks today and thank you everyone who has joined the call. We've heard from Dr. Bolshewitz that dietary fiber is the key to human health. Christy Anderson illuminated the steep costs of a population not eating enough fiber. Tracy McWhorter explained that the fiber crisis among African Americans is a modern phenomenon. It's a stark example of how government policies combined with industry practices can dramatically affect everyday Americans. But it's not just about individuals. Private industry lacks access to. Despite efforts to source domestically, Miyoko's Creamery must buy ingredients from beyond our borders. And then there's Paul. He wants to leave a viable farm to his children. 
In the face of a changing climate and evolving markets, he's choosing to adapt by diversifying into fiber-rich foods, the very foods I hope we've demonstrated here today that Americans are not getting enough of. So why aren't we? Some might say we're lazy, perhaps education's a factor, and certainly issues of access are at play. But is that all? Well, consider these two observations. One, the Food and Nutrition Service reports that after accounting for waste, our food system only supplies about half the dietary fiber we need. You don't need an advanced degree in math to solve this puzzle. Perhaps people aren't eating enough fiber because there's not enough to go around. Two, we're not investing in fiber rich foods. You've likely heard that approximately 2% of federal farm spending goes to fruits and vegetables, but fiber comes in other plant crops too. So we looked into it uh, based on publicly available data. We estimate that less than 10% of federal farm spending is on foods that retain their fiber by the time they land on our dinner plates. The simple fact is farm spending doesn't mirror nutritional recommendations and supply may be an issue. Just to make sure we're all on the same page here, the My Plate nutritional recommendations would have 75% of our plates be fiber rich foods. And yet of every dollar in taxes I send to DC to support American farmers, only 10 cents are invested in the foods my government tells me to eat. By not investing in these foods, we're making them comparatively expensive and out of reach for millions of my countrymen. So are we going to rectify this mismatch? I don't see any reason why we can't and farm policy may hold the key. And so I'm very gratified to see agriculture leaders identifying nutrition security as a top priority. Indeed, Agriculture Secretary Tom Vilsack often connects the dots between farm policy, nutrient-dense foods, and the prevention of diet-related diseases. A favorite statistic he cites often is, quote, the Medicaid and Medicare budget for diet-related diseases is roughly $160 billion a year, more than the entire USDA budget for a year. His point is that if we invest USDA dollars in nutrition-rich foods, we could lower our spending on diet-related diseases, or as Dr. B says, an ounce of fiber equals a pound of cure. So leaders have identified the problem. They've assessed the devastating scale of the problem, but what specific goals will they aim for in the coming farm bill to fix this problem? How about prioritizing dietary fiber? Fortunately, the Farm Bill is chock full of programs that contain the seeds for real progress. For example, the Build Back Better Bill increases the Office of Urban Agriculture's budget sevenfold. This is an example of a great start. Secretary Vilsack also often quotes Robert Kennedy, who asked, why not? In that spirit, and as the next farm bill approaches, let's ask together, why not set specific goals? For example, you could set minimums for percent of spending that must go to fiber rich foods, program by program, as it makes sense, from Title I to Title XII. Why not establish a mantra, direct every person working across committees and departments to prioritize fiber rich foods? And why not empower farmers? Rather than pay them to plant crops that wind up devoid of fiber on the dinner table, let's encourage farmers to diversify into producing sustainable fiber-rich food crops and in doing so, feed nutrition insecure neighbors in rural and urban communities alike. Setting and achieving such, such goals can bring benefits beyond nutrition. Fiber-rich foods tend to use less water and emit little, if any, carbon. Using restorative agriculture methods, American farmers can build soil fertility, encourage wild pollinators, and sequester even more carbon. 
When local farmers are empowered to feed their neighbors through, for example, the local agriculture marketing programs in Title 10, we can build local food system durability in the face of who knows what global systemic rifts are coming next, we could stand to bolster our resiliency. We taxpayers spend so much on Title IV, and rightly so, but imagine how much more effective those dollars could be at achieving nutrition security when the underlying food system is supplying adequate amounts of sustainable and diverse fiber-rich foods. So today, as a taxpayer, as an American who cares about the health of our nation, I ask you, what can you do to prioritize dietary fiber in the coming farm bill? Addison? Thank you, Laura. And I think what we can do now is turn to our panel to start to answer that question. Because I, while I'm not the expert, I'm excited to learn more along with the rest of the audience. So first, I want to turn to Dr. Bolshevitz and probably to you as well, Laura. If we prioritize dietary fiber, will we be seeing a trade-off on protein in the food supply? Can you enlighten me a little bit on, you know, as we think about this trade-off, these nutritional trade-offs, both in terms of individual health, but also in the broader supply chain? Sure. So uh, speaking first anecdotally from my experience as a clinical gastroenterologist, I, I, I work in a regular gastroenterology practice. I've seen patients today and protein deficiency simply doesn't exist. This is not something that is a concern of mine. And the statistics would back this up. 97% of Americans are consuming not just adequate amounts of protein, but an excess of protein. In fact, Addison, when they've studied this and they've looked at people with different dietary patterns, what they found is that people who eat a, a plant predominant or plant exclusive diet get more than enough protein. Because in the Western world, we have access to a diverse mix of different foods and those different foods, guess what? These plants, they all contain protein, all of them. Every single plant contains protein. So just as an example, uh, I thought I would uh, bring forward a comparison between black beans and ground beef, for example. If you give me four ounces of each, both four ounces of black beans and four ounces of ground beef, you will find that they have exactly the same amount of protein. The difference being that the black beans have basically no saturated fat, whereas the ground beef has literally no fiber at all. And, you know, we could get, dig into the details even more if we wanted to, but the point is that our plants, our food that we're talking about that are our fiber rich foods, they all contain protein. And there was a recent review done by Professor Christopher Gardner, who's at Stanford University. He's a global nutrition expert. And he was looking at plant predominant diets, including vegetarian diets. And effectively the punchline of his review at the end was this, there is no evidence of protein deficiency among the, among the vegetarian community in the Western world. So from my perspective, I am not concerned about us crowding out or losing protein. If anything, what we're doing is we're getting healthier sources of protein, sources of protein that would include dietary fiber and provide all the benefits that we've been discussing today. And Christy, um, I have a question here. If Americans started to eat more fiber, what, um, would this end up being a supply issue if we, we could just import more fiber-ish foods or oats or something like that? How do we think about the upstream supply issue here? Yeah, thanks, Addison. And that's a great question. And sorry, I get the afternoon sun, so I'm like, I'm blinded in light right now. <laughs> it's good when you're working during the day to stay awake in the winter. I can right, right, that. right. Exactly right. Um, you know, Putting aside the supply chain issues we're facing because of COVID, which is a whole other, you know, variable in and of itself. I think it's important as we explore getting more dietary fiber rich foods into the American diet and changing the agriculture system that we look at how we increase production at home um, for a variety of reasons. One, I think it goes toward um, you know, supporting that local farmer, supporting the local economy. Uh, we also know too that when you support local economies, you're um, as you look at you know climate change and how that's affecting uh, agriculture and nutritional value of the foods we eat. 
the more we can keep it local, the better, you know, our air quality is going to be. So it's overall better for our environment. Um, you know, it provides our rural communities and our agriculture system and our farmers more resiliency. I know Laura always likes to talk about it. it's also a national security issue to make sure that we have those healthy fiber rich foods grown at home. So they're available, right? You never know what's going to happen at the international stage. And then the last point I'll make is there are programs within the federal government, such as school meals that have a Buy American requirement. So if we want our children to eat more fruits and vegetables, more fiber rich foods, which, you know, in the past decade, there's been tremendous changes and they're, they're eating so much better, but, you know, we can still improve upon those meals. Um, you know, they, they have to be able to buy them from American farmers. That's right. And I think that makes me think a little bit about the remarks from Paul and thinking about how we're trying to influence also to enable farmers here in America to make this transition. Paul, what is it that helps you? I heard you saying that specifically the market making activities like what's going on with Miyoko's Creamery uh, to be able to sell um, fiber rich foods into the supply chain. But are there other ways that the government can support you? Yes, thank you. I guess mainly, um, you know, give well, from the dairy farm, the dairy standpoint, you know, give us an incentives to um, to plant other crops. Um, right now, with dairy, we get um, to benefit from certain programs. We have to to keep dairying. We have to keep milking cows, um, even though the prices have been lagging for you know the last five, ten years. We keep getting it's kind of the carrots in front of the donkey. We keep getting payments to keep farming, to keep trudging along until you either fall off the wagon or um, you quit or you uh, try to thrive or whatnot. I guess the, the, the government programs, um, they mean well, but I think the, the, um, I think they're off the mark. Yeah, and so you know, it goes back to thinking also the conversa the the remarks that Miyoko made as well, where oftentimes for you to get all the inputs you need, you have to be going abroad, and so that does sounds like a challenge. Do you do you have a are you are you building relationships with other farmers as well? How do you how do you approach this as kind of a business constraint for you, Miyoko? We are able to procure a number of ingredients from the United States, but it is limited. The types of crops that we need actually are grown abroad. There is a crop that we believe would be fantastic to be grown in the United States. It fits our climate. Uh, and this is what we're trying to do is move our supply chain for this ingredient from China to the United States. Uh, we have contacts also with downstream uh, processors that can help process these raw materials. And we believe that this is a fiber rich and protein rich uh, crop that could be utilized not just by us, but many other companies as well. Thank you, Miyoko. Yes. And so, you know, this makes me think a little bit more about our, and so by the way, I'm noticing that we are promoting a few folks up to be able to ask questions, questions directly. However, as we start thinking about the making our supply chain local, not only in terms of nationally local, but I want to think a little, a little bit more locally. And I think this gets to some of the remarks that Tracy was talking about. How do we start to think about the community level and start thinking about disadvantaged communities or communities that have been left out of the fiber fold. How do we start thinking about doing more local local development of fiber supply chains for individuals? Are you addressing that to me specifically? Yeah, are there community-based organizations that you work with or think about that are addressing some of these more disadvantaged community aspects to the fiber supply chain? Well, first, um, let me say that the the term that I prefer to use is, is systemically excluded. Um, that's that's what I hope that I that mm -hmm. I uh, help to convey in my talks. Um, you know, because we have been historically um, African American communities in particular have have been eating the most fiber um, up until several decades ago, mm -hmm. um, and so as part of that. Um, we know that we have communities that have been growing their own food. And even during the 1970s, when this, from the 1970s through the 1990s, when this shift began to happen, 
um, in terms of the way that we eat, in terms of food apartheid being created in um, predominantly low income African American communities and cities, we still had organizations that were focused on local community efforts to grow their own foods in lots, in abandoned lots, in their homes, um, in community gardens. This has been something that has never gone away. It's been consistent. So it's not a new movement. What's, what's been happening is that it's been expanded um, locally. And that's what we want to see in Crete. So there are organizations all across the country that have been doing this in, in um, low income black communities rural communities, um, other, communi other communities of color as well. So I think, um, Laura, you may have some organizations that you, that you wanna point to specifically um, for our panel today. Yes. Yeah, a few organizations I really like in my neck of the woods, uh, the Bay Area, um, Fresh Approach. They're really good at, they're very food truck based and they get a lot of fresh fruits and vegetables out to communities that don't have ready access and um, at the end of their session they just give all the the food away it's pretty great um, and then there's grow where you are in Atlanta they're doing amazing work um, they could use access to more land uh, but they are they're growing vegetables in a very sustainable way and I'm excited to um, see how we can put the Office of Urban Agriculture grants uh, in front of them and, and see if they can capitalize on those. And then there's the Detroit Black um, Community Food Security Network in Detroit. Uh, and Malik Yakini is doing really inspirational work there. So those are three examples. So Laura, let me keep you on here for a second. Um, you know, I had a question from uh, from Jane Velez Mitchell earlier that asked, you know, points out, I think it, it was made apparently by our, our panel that we're in the midst of a health crisis involving obesity and type two diabetes amongst um, even children. Yet we see con um, continued underinvestment from the USDA into fiber rich um, uh, foods. And I think it kind of gets to the heart of this question of, what are the specific policy approaches that AFA is supporting to be able to address this underinvestment and how can we think about the systemic change that needs to be made? Yeah, so we've published on our website um, dozens of specific in, um, ideas and a lot of them are about expanding programs that already exist. We really like the LAMP program in Title 10, for example. But ultimately, um, as we were identifying these opportunities for improvement, um, it really was clear that it's important that policymakers and the people who are implementing policy really have fiber rich foods top of mind because what the USDA does so well is offer risk mitigation to farmers. When we talk with farmers and I talk with professors at like the University of Wisconsin, it's all about managing risk and they look to USDA for that. And when we look at the who's getting the front row service for risk management, it's not necessarily the fiber rich food producers, it's, it's the other ones who, who like they already, they're already keyed into um, uh, taking advantage of these programs. So from risk mitigation to credit access, access to financing, um, overseas export help. It's really about every single program where it makes sense, obviously, just elevating the fiber rich food producers and in fact, encouraging farmers who are maybe doing soy corn rotations and helping them to diversify some portion into fiber rich food production. I just saw a documentary, documentary the other day and it was stark just looking out at the number of farms that had lost, they had kind of gotten gobbled up and it, it turned into like huge single farm farming operations and all the small family farms were gone. And the, the, the farmers who were left, they were growing food that they can't even eat. So they're definitely not feeding their neighbors. Um, maybe it's, it's possible to take so much of that American farmland and just transform it a bit to 
you know, dial up the fiber rich foods. And uh, I think it'll increase national security and it'll, it'll get some fiber into our bellies, like Dr. Will said. That's right. And what I see here is this, this opportunity for policy shaping public health outcomes, but through the supply chain and through the food, food industry itself. And so it brings me back, I want to go back and ask uh, Dr. Bolshevitz again, you know, you brought up a lot of really interesting facts of what are the impacts of increasing um, our, our fiber intake. But what to you, you know, you know, there's like a lot of great kind of large level epi epidemic meological studies there, but how do you think about it from the individual standpoint? You as a as a as an eater, you know, how do you, how do you approach this, and how do you think about filling out, you know, going out and increasing your individual's um, fiber supply? This is this is Addison, perhaps the easiest question I've ever received because I've lived at this myself. So I'm just sharing my own personal experience, which is that if you went back a few years ago. I uh, was about 50 pounds overweight and had high blood pressure, had health issues, and honestly felt horrible. And I was in my early 30s. And it was the result of the standard American diet that I was consuming. And my mind needed to be opened to the possibility that these foods that my grandmother always told me I should be eating, perhaps I should actually give that a try and see what happens. And that's what I did. And I started to transition myself towards a more plant-centered diet. And as I did this, you know, through smoothies, salads, soups, things of this variety. Uh, and as I did this, I instantly noticed the difference in terms of my energy levels, my hair, my skin, and weight that I struggled to lose, even though the fact that I was working out six days a week, again, I was in my early 30s at the time, uh, I was working out six days a week for about an hour each time and could not lose weight. Yet, when I changed my diet, all of a sudden, the weight starts melting off my body. So for me, the way that I approached it and the way that I was able to make a shift in my diet was that I, I opened my mind to the nourishing uh, nature of these foods, the fact that I am rewarding my body by bringing these foods into my life as opposed to consuming foods that could potentially cause harm to my body. And so I started to gravitate towards them, try to bring more of them in. One of my focuses was really on variety. There's actually, I didn't speak as much about this as I would love to, but one of the key points of my book is that variety actually is critically important when it comes to the gut microbiome. These gut microbes actually need us to consume a wide variety of plants in order to be optimally healthy. So I started to gravitate towards the uh, broad diversity and variety of foods. And as I did this, I, I had the health effects that I was really hoping to find. I lost 50 pounds. Um, my blood pressure pills were thrown in the trash. I feel like I reversed aging. I, I I'm 41 years old. I feel younger than I did when I was 30. And um, so I, I think that really, you know, from my perspective, it was just un the understanding that uh, by consuming these foods, I could be rewarding my gut microbes, fueling them with their proper optimal nutrition, and that there would be uh, improvements in my health throughout my entire body. And it really did happen. Excellent. I mean, the anecdotal is often the most impactful. So thank you for that information. I see we have a raised hand from Anna Whitney. Anna, would you unmute yourself and feel free to ask? Sure. Yeah. And thank you for, um, for recognizing my um, question here. So I, my question is like on the level of the consumer getting to the grocery store and, you know, choosing between low and high fiber food, assuming that they have the high fiber option, which I know is not a given, but like, um, assuming that, how do you address the fact that low fiber foods are designed to be more addictive and bingeable? Who would like to jump in here from the panel? Who has a opinion? I think many have opinion. Oh, Tracy, I see you're starting to speak. Feel free to unmute yourself. Thank you. I, I will just address that really quickly because I've been teaching people, I myself have been um, eating this way for 35 plus years, plant exclusive, and have been teaching it for more than 30. And so um, one of the, and so this is a question that I get a lot, people who are addicted to fat, who are addicted to salt, who are addicted to sugar, or addicted to processed foods, how can they um, eat more um, fiber-rich plant-based foods? How do they do it? 
And um, so one of the things that I always tell people is to start with adding rather than taking away. And this is a really simple, probably common approach that other folks have. But if you start with adding more uh, fruits, vegetables and whole grains, uh, beans and nuts, it begins to change your taste buds, right? And it, you begin to want these types of foods more than you want the processed foods. It's actually quite a simple process. It can take seven days, 14 days, 21 days typically at the most. But the more that you add these foods to your plate, the more you crowd out the other fiber less foods fiber, uh, the foods that, that are low in fiber, and the more you want these fiber rich foods, especially if you, you know, know how to cook them, you learn how to season them well. Um, um, and so that's what I generally um, say to people is just to start adding, and you will find that your taste buds, this isn't a, this isn't a years long process, it's not even typically a month long process, it will happen. And so you just start where you are by adding these fiber rich foods to your plate. So that's what I wanted to add. Thank you, Tracy. And I saw an interesting question that came through the Q&A and it goes back to a conversation we were having earlier in between the federal and the um, local. And I think Laura, this comes back to you, a question from Helena. Um, in a system that supports locally grown foods and feeding the community, how will that change the responsibility of local state and state governments versus the federal government in terms of policy oversight and implementation of increasing a fiber-based uh, diet? I almost feel like Christy might be the better person to answer this, but one thing I, I had before I hand it over to Christy, we've been talking with a lot of farmers and a lot of farming stakeholders, and it's clear that there's a model of farming that we all kind of want to to be the future, which is like the like Paul's the small farm family farm going it alone, and then like creating what they're creating and selling it to the market. But it, it seems to me looking at um, cooperatives and associations that maybe there's some potential in, in um, having policy encourage the formation and maybe give some templates so that like a dozen or two dozen farmers around a community can form an association and have some sort of a local governance where they can share tools, they can kind of uh, strategize on a regular basis. You're gonna grow this, I'm gonna grow this. We're going to intercrop some things so that we get the benefit of guilds and we don't have to use as many pesticides and et cetera. Um, so to that degree, I would think a local and a state level government might have a, a really strong role. And the federal government could contemplate some programs to encourage it. Christy? Yeah, um, again, another great question. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to take the easy way out at first and say it depends. <laughs> I mean, it really just depends on what policy, what program we're talking about, right? Because we live in a very complex governmental feudalistic um, system, right? And so it's about threading that needle that ensures that state and local communities are serving the communities the best way, their communities the best way they can, but also ensuring that the federal government still has oversight. I mean, the reason why we have things like, you know, food safety inspections is because somebody somewhere wasn't doing it right, right, and people got sick. So that's why it's done on a national level to make sure that every American has you know, the same opportunity to eat safe food. Now, is it perfect? And that's a whole nother question, probably a whole nother discussion. No, but, you know, there are places that weren't doing it and had no interest to do that. I just use as an example. But in addition, you know, the federal government has an awesome power and awesome fiscal responsibility to help encourage looking at the national level and wanting to get more fiber rich diets in the mouths and the bellies, if you will, of of Americans to use that power, to use that um, legislative process, to use that regulatory process, to use that taxpayer dollar to guide states and to guide localities into meeting those needs. 
Great. Thank you, Christy. Well, I see we're at the top of the hour, and I want to go ahead and hand it back to Laura to be able to give us some closing remarks and kind of the last step on understanding where do we go next in this conversation? This has been rich. There's a lot of questions we couldn't get to. How do we move forward together as a group? How do we move forward? Well, let's continue the conversation about fiber-rich foods going into 2022. AFA would love to work with you on implementing a pilot program we call the Farms Amendment. So in addition to tweaking existing programs from Title I to Title 12, we propose amending the Farming Opportunities Training and Outreach or photo portion of Title 12 with a pilot program to help farmers like Paul diversify into growing fiber rich food crops. You'll find links to more information about the Farms Amendment on our website as well as a contact form to reach out and continue the conversation. Our website is agriculturefairnessalliance.org. I wanna thank you, Addison, for moderating today, the AFA team on IT, everyone who took an hour out of their day to tune in, including busy people from the Senate and House Ag Committees and the USDA. I especially thank our panel of experts who made such a compelling case for focusing on dietary fiber in farm policy. So all I want to leave you with is this final question. What are you going to do to make fiber rich foods a priority going into the next farm bill? Thank you.